Hello, everybody, and indeed, welcome to another edition of Who's Your Hometown Heroes. I'm Tony Val. If you have a child who is struggling in some way with the school experience, you won't want to miss today's guest. She is Lindy Metz, and she is an educational consultant and leadership coach and the founder and head of school at Acton Academy at Fall Creek. I invite you now to enjoy my enlightening meeting with Lindy Metz. Who's Your Hometown Heroes is sponsored by Prometheus Consulting. Prometheus is Indy's most trusted name in outsourced IT support. Lindy, thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Here is where I would like to start. I know, obviously, we're going to eventually talk about Acton and what a what a wonderful place it is and all that sort of thing. But where I want to start is... In your assessment, what is wrong with traditional compulsory schooling today? Why are so many parents coming to you and saying, can can we please join your school? Okay, so this is going to be an interesting answer, which you probably will be surprised by. I do not believe it's wrong for everyone. But back in 2002, when I got into education, and I graduated and started working within the traditional setting, I started taking notes on what could be better. So I believe right now, the way that the majority of the world is taught and the educational environments where a lot of people send children is stifling to individuals. So I started taking notes early on things like, well, this child really wants to be outside a lot. This child really just wants to stand up every now and then. This child really loves sitting down to do work for a long time. And so I don't really use the word wrong. I use the word different a lot because every person's different. And the things that one person needs to be successful are always different than the things that somebody else needs. So it. What drove me to act in, in a learner-driven approach, was seeing how the traditional model only addressed the needs of a certain type of individual. And always in my classroom, there were people that were farther along academically and bored, or not quite where the rest were and struggling. So Yes. Yeah. I, I think anyone, uh, uh, you know, my age, let's say, for example, you know, can attest to the fact that, um, yes, school traditionally, for at least for a very, very long time, has been about <laughs> trying to get everyone to move along at the same pace, even though we're all different. Some of us, let's face it, some some of us are uh, better at math. Some of us are better at reading. Some of us can't sit still. Others of us are perfectly uh, able to sit still. So mm. it is a little bit like... Um, hurting cats uh mm -hmm. it at least my my memory of school is that way now what's interesting is i think of myself i came out of that whole experience i i went to a, a catholic school in the chicago area mm -hmm. uh grade school and high school and i would say for me it was it was a tremendous experience i i when i was unleashed on the world uh so to speak you know as an adult I said, by golly, I, I really got a, a good foundation. But but at the same time, I, I, could, I recognize for myself and for others that uh, there were many, many days where it didn't feel fun. Mm -hmm. And I certainly would rather have been doing other things. And then some of my students, it's, it's like they never shook that feeling. My fellow students, I should say, never shook that feeling of I should be doing something else. And it wasn't until they got out of that kind of meat grinder, mm -hmm. they, it's like they started their lives then, mm -hmm. you know. Right. So that's interesting. Now, now, Lindy, can we talk a, a bit more about your your history? So you taught in traditional schools starting yeah. out. And so when we talk about the um, the challenge of you said herding cats the challenge of working with 20 to 30 students in a setting where they're all supposed to be on the same grade level supposed to be um 
I lived that challenge daily for a really long time. And so I started my career in IPS. And I worked there for a few years with third graders and then first graders. And so I firsthand felt the responsibility, obligation, and opportunity to provide what 25 people need. And how do we best do that, right? And so, of course, the traditional model of a similar lesson plan and a similar schedule and everyone doing the same thing at the same time was helpful to teachers that are trying to work with 25 to 30 people all at once, right? Um, Of course, group restroom breaks were helpful when you have 25 to 30 people. Of course, a cafeteria with similar procedures are helpful. And so my, like I said, when I got started, I started like taking notes over where I noticed that children were having a tough time keeping in line. And sometimes when I say that, people are like, oh, well, then your school must just be wild and crazy people doing whatever they want, wandering around. And that's not true. So I think that there is a misconception that if we're not factory model conveyor belt, then we're going to be wild and crazy. So my my start was in the classroom. I moved down to Georgia and I went uh, straight from teaching first and third grade here to teaching fourth and fifth grade there. Uh, I did that for a while, and then I became an um, an intervention specialist for our school. So I would work with children that are in the category that I've been taking notes on the whole time, which is the traditional environment's not working for them, but this is their their neighborhood school. Their parents aren't in a position to make a different choice for them right now for education. And so then they would kind of end up on my list, K through five because something wasn't clicking, whether it was the environment or the content or the expectations, something wasn't clicking. So then I got an entire year to get into the minds of children who weren't working within the traditional environment, but they weren't necessarily, you know, needing an IEP or having special needs. They were in the middle of just not complying or not, and not in a behavioral way, just they, they didn't have the same response to the instructional model that their peers had. And so I would work with those students daily for a year. At the end of that year, my school district said, okay, you've been doing a fantastic job with our school with 1,000 children, which I saw K through five every day. We actually, we've had some budget cuts and we need uh, you to take on another school of 1,000 children. And Tony, you've known me for a while now. And so you probably know that I don't set myself up for failure. (laughs) Like (laughs) I set myself up for success. And so when I heard 2000, I was like, you guys, uh, I thank you for asking, but I don't think I'm personally able. And so that kind of ricocheted me into this other uh, area of education because I had gotten my master's degree while I was teaching and stuff like that. And um, I decided that time to to apply to be an educational consultant. And so I started working with a company out of Scottsdale, Arizona, which would contract with schools that would need a turnaround. And so my title was a turnaround schools coach. So I would be hired by superintendents to come into school systems and help them find the gaps and solve the problems so that in most of those environments, we increase test scores, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, in uh, kind of, I think, hidden in plain sight in a way, it occurs to me that both scenarios, kind of traditional school where kids are, you know, doing fairly well or maybe very well, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and alongside of uh, your function as kind of helping kids who are struggling, Mm -hmm. When they come to you and say, uh, we know you're working with a thousand kids, let's make it 2000. I think it's obvious that they still want, for the kids who aren't doing so well, they still want some sort of cookie cutter, one size fits all approach. Mm-hmm. And I'm not hearing that there's any space for an individual lesson plan for an individual child, an individual life. What is right for this particular child? 
Well, so I had small groups that I would work with, right? And it was daily. So they would be with it, within my room, my classroom, but the majority of their day was spent in their regular classroom. So basically all I was trying to do was early on, before I started working with school districts, I was trying to uncover gaps individually and say, how do we, how do I either work with you to give you strategies that will help you in your classroom? Or how do I work with your teacher or the whole grade level team to give them some suggestions for how this can be more easily accessible to all children? And so I wouldn't say that they didn't value individual plans. Mm. I think that the the issue for ma the majority of schools that serve a lot of people is of course we value and we want to meet every individual's needs, but we have a set time and place and structure and curriculum and we have yeah. to deliver it by you know, the pacing is pretty rigorous. We have to deliver it. And if people get left behind, we really are kind of stuck with what to do. I don't think it's ever been, we don't want to meet the needs of them. I think that amazing teachers exist and they are the ones that are working really hard to make sure that their classroom does meet the needs of all people. It's just that we look at the the caseload of a classroom teacher, even a special education teacher, like that's a lot of people to try to deliver curriculum and meet all expectations with. So, yeah. mm. you know, um, I don't, know that I've ever shared this with you before. So my mother was a public school teacher for many, many years. She she was a uh, speech and language uh, clinician. And um, so oddly enough, so growing up in my house, we would host a lot of the teacher parties mm. over the years. And she made very, very good friends. Mm -hmm. um, but something I noticed is that, and I didn't understand it at the time, but in hindsight, uh, these, uh, these teachers would get together and I think it was, uh, uh, mostly women, not that that matters, but that just happened to be the case, but th they were just, when they would get together, they would express frustration. So frustrated, like they're kind of like they were handcuffed. Mm -hmm. and I saw this, I saw this really over years. Mm -hmm. I also, I can recall, um, uh, uh, way back in the day, many, many moons ago, date, dating a nice young lady who was a Chicago uh, public school teacher. Same thing, just expressing just unbelievable frustration. Like my mm -hmm. hands are tied. I can't help. I want to help. I want to do something and the system is broken. Um, and now even, uh, even I have a niece who was a public school teacher, yeah. super excited. She had that fire in her belly. And finally, uh, she she was ground up and spit out. She said, my gosh, I'm so frustrated. So it seems to me that uh, I've noticed this, this trend that, again, this is a system that's kind of top down. It's kind of centralized most of uh, schooling in our country. And uh, so really, I think maybe that's a great segue to Acton Academy. Let's let's talk about Acton and why why it's different, why it works so well. Full disclosure, our 13-year-old uh, Lewis is, has been an act in a few years now, loves it. Mm -hmm. So do you have like a two-minute elevator pitch? What do you, what do you, how do you describe how Acton works? Yes. So at Acton, we really lean into the individual strengths and areas of improvement for each learner. We're a, a learner-driven environment, which means that our school is set up with the children in mind more so than with the adults in mind. Uh, so they have self-paced learning, hands-on instruction. Um, really, if you go into an act in anywhere around the country, you'll probably hear the children say, we don't have teachers, we are the teachers. Because we really rely on the strengths and the potential of each individual within our schools to make the experience magical. So um, instead of having a top-down teacher that knows everything, or knows the most in the room. Acton addresses the fact that we don't. The adults don't know the most just because they're older. Children actually have the potential to learn, do, create way more. They blow me out of the water creativity-wise every single day. And so our school really provides the environment where they can learn about who they are, so that they can impact the world for good. And our tagline is find a calling, change the world. And so finding a calling is all about who am I? What drives me? What scares me? How am I gifted? How am I wired? 
And then change the world is like, how do I use all that I've learned about who I am? And I'm continuing to learn about who I am to impact the world and leave it a better place than I found it. So that is our school model. Very nice. And is it safe to say, now this has been the experience in our household, but uh, is this across the board? But typically, Acton students don't bring, don't do homework. Yeah, we don't have homework. No. That was something in the traditional setting that was a really hot topic for me because I just feel like if children are with us from eight to three, I don't know why we would send more work home with them. Like they have a family that's really important or hobbies that they love or they want to play outside or eat dinner with their families, you know? And so, so I've never really understood the extra practice called homework. Yes. You know, I, I will uh, tell you, I, and I don't know if how common this is as a parent, but you've known me for a while. I, I have a creative side. I kind of like, I naturally think outside the box. And I like having the ability to almost do what I would call freelance with Lewis, our 13-year-old. Our I like, I, I really appreciate that we don't have homework because I, as a parent, I can use that time to just do something creative, something else, something different. Something that comes to mind is uh, uh, I, I took Lewis to a, uh, a pro, a pro wrestling match mm -hmm. uh, up in Muncie, Muncie a, a few weekends ago. It was so fun, but but to me, that's like a that's a learning environment. You know, we we talked throughout the throughout the night. We talked about uh, you know the business of wrestling. Look at this. Look, how much do you think they're taking in? Who? Do, what are all their expenses? You know, what's what's working? What's not? What do you think these wrestlers make? You know. And it was it was fascinating on so many levels. We were entertained, but it was also a little bit educational. Mm -hmm. So again, just as a parent, I w when Lewis was in traditional school, homework was kind of a nightmare because, as you said, I I, I was thinking to myself, well, you've had my child for whatever it is, eight hours. Mm -hmm. Why did why am I? why are we still spending time on the lesson plan? Let's go out and experience life. Right. That's that's a learning environment as well. Well, and you and Lewis recently also made a pretty sweet music video and that's a part of the learning as well, right? So like you were able to do that and have those ideas and unleash your creativity together as a father and son because you didn't have all these other things and my experience, uh, you know, in children, because I my kids have gone to traditional school as recently as last year. And if it would have been a fit, and maybe it still might be for one of our three, right? We're still figuring him out. But um, the homework really became more for me than for him. It was more of a chore of me, like sitting down with him and trying to get him to do it. And I remember as a fourth and fifth grade teacher, um, and third grade too, that especially when the trend was like the new math, right? Oh my Lord. For those five years, that was rough because parents would come to me and I was, you know, required to send home homework. What I did with it so in some schools or some settings, I got to decide how I used it. But in some, they're like, no, you have to have this homework grade, right? You know, so in that case, it matched the teachers that you have observed where your hands are tied because I was made to do that. But what was really interesting about those experiences was that the children who are in my classroom with me every day weren't the frustrated ones about the homework. The parents were the frustrated ones about the homework. So then I was like, huh, this is really interesting. So now instead of children having time with their families to do cool things, you know, explore hobbies, have fun, now we're creating a frustrating experience for parent and child at home when they should be connecting and being kind to one another and doing things that they enjoy. Now we've even gone a step farther and made them mad at each other because there's an, you know, <laughs> going to be blame and why don't you know this and how do I learn this? And now I got to contact the teacher, right? So I just never understood all of that. But I love that you, you as the parent are using those opportunities and myself as well. Like when we, when the children and I go anywhere, 
you know, anything then is a learning experience. We especially love to go to new businesses and kind of poke holes in what's great about this and what still needs to be improved. What do you think they're going to work on? But you see, we, you and I have those opportunities because we have time with our children. Yes. Yes. That is not determined by somebody else. <clears throat> you know, speaking of entrepreneurial, I, uh, I grabbed a couple of, uh, let me see if I can find it. I grabbed a couple of paragraphs let me just read this and let's maybe we can uh, get your thoughts about this. Uh, okay, here's just a couple of paragraphs from the interwebs. Generations ago, America was a place where young Benjamin Franklin, a candlemaker's son with only two years of formal education, could ascend into worldwide prominence as a leading writer, scientist, inventor, statesman, printer, and publisher. America was a place where Thomas Edison, who with only a few months of formal education, had already left home by age 13 to sell newspapers, candy, and vegetables on trains and was earning a salary equivalent in today's dollars of $97,000 per year by age 13. And I actually, I looked up the math. I did, I... uh and so that that ninety seven thousand dollars is is in two thousand uh, twenty four dollars, wow. soon to be worthless. It feels like within the next couple of years. But anyway, isn't that amazing? Uh, America was a place where you it, it was like a, a, an entrepreneurial wildfire. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I would say it still is. But entrepreneurship happens when you have time to explore so solutions to problems within the world, right? And if you don't have time because you're doing other things for other people all the time, yeah, then you're limited with that resource. So, yes, we have entrepreneurship as a huge part of our program. In fact, we started in um, Texas as an Acton MBA program as well. And so... We are equipping children all of the time to look at what their interests are. And really, some actins like have the messaging that we're building CEOs, like we're unleashing into the world people that are going to go out and start revolutions and start businesses that will make the world a better place in the area that they're passionate in. In fact, our whole high school program, and I was going to say, like you talked about, uh, Thomas being able to go to work with his dad, like a huge part of our program in middle school and high school is apprenticeships so that children can go out and get real world experience as early as possible. And then that leads into, in our high school program, we call it Launchpad, the next great adventure where it's no longer apprenticeships. It's like we have been studying ourselves and the world and how we can fit and make differences for so long that now we're going to nail down a target and a commitment and we're going to step out into the world and ask for big things and go change it. So that's already baked into our 10 through 17 year old experience. Instead of, like you said, if people have gone traditional routes, people, colleagues of yours or mine, right? And they they did the whole 13 year experience. Then they went to college because they thought they, they had to. Uh, they were there for four years. They might have figured out what they wanted to do, but likely they did not. And so now you're 21 out in the world getting to do what our act and really four-year-olds get to do, which is find out who you are. <laughs> I know it doesn't happen all at once at four, but it starts at four. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, another vote for entrepreneurialism, uh, I would say as a parent, as you noted, time is of the essence because, because Lewis has time. Now I have an opportunity, but as an entrepreneur myself, one of the things that's afforded me is time. I I, I own my own schedule. Mm -hmm. So um, that has been invaluable. You know, I think sometimes about, uh, you know, on my deathbed, what's going to be my scorecard, you know, and I'm not going to be the next Bill Gates or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to drive the most BMWs and Mercedes. However, boy, did, will I have had the chance to spend a lot of time with my child. And that's, that's yeah. super important to me. Well, and, and because you didn't want to or need to be those things. You yeah. don't want to be 
Bill Gates. So you don't want to drive, you know, whatever car. Like the thing that I think is the most valuable about Acton is that we actually get to empower children to find out what they want and what they need so that they can go do those things. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Another full circle thing, uh, back to the topic of music for a moment. I'm, you know, music is part of my, has been part of my life. It certainly was part of my childhood. And so I, I spent a lot of time in high school and college um, creating music, right? Writing music, recording music, that sort of thing. And over the years, I've kind of decided that I think the entrepreneurial part of my brain actually comes from that early training. Mm -hmm. I, I was able to uh, unknowingly, or just because it was fun, I trained myself to create things in my mind. When you're creating music, you, you act, it, it happens in your mind first, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then it changing something. Oh, let me try a different baseline or something different with the drums. That's in the mind that happens in the mind first. And then it, and then it, uh, right. it comes out into reality. And mm -hmm. so this is our music project with Lewis. This is another kind of, that's the secret teaching that I'm, I'm trying to impart to him is I, I want to say, uh, uh, notice, notice all of this. The, like, so we did a cover of, uh, Gary Newman's cars the other day. Still running through my head. <laughs> And, you know, it's interesting because that started in his mind first, assuming he's really the person who wrote it, doesn't matter. Whoever wrote it, it happened in that mind first. Mm -hmm. And then for Lewis and I, what happened in our minds first is, I wonder how in the world that song is put together. I wonder how it works. I wonder what's the drum beat, what's the... And so in my mind, this is a, a tremendous um, uh, learning opportunity, you know, my uh, my dad said to me years ago when Lewis was born. He he said uh, he said you're you're going to do a great job of showing Lewis the world, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this gets back to what you said: time, time. If yeah. we don't have the time to do this stuff, nothing happens, and it's all frustration. Yes, and what you've also shown Lewis as we walk through, you know, in the apprenticeship process, you're you're really doing a mini apprenticeship at that point because he is seeing and learning if he really loves to do that. Do I love to produce? Do I love to investigate all these things? And so as young as 13, and I know that he's been in music and theater and other things, right? Since even younger, he is getting to experience what could possibly be a path for him instead of being stuck and being limited to what other people think he should be doing right now. So for sure, while, while we're on entrepreneurship still, you know, the children's business fair is how Acton started. And so Lewis has participated in children's business fairs. And that is a really special thing because children who aren't choosing to attend Acton do get the experience of being their own boss for that day. And we have seen amazing things come out of that. So there have been like a thousand fairs worldwide. And even that glimmer of and little taste of entrepreneurship for some people, that's enough, right? There have been lots of success stories of children just realizing because it's, it's more about awareness. Like you said, it happens in the mind first. So if in your mind, you actually have an experience where you can create something, sell it, make money the awareness of the power that you have within you has just exponentially increased. So it's all around this entire mission and project that we're doing together is to make sure that children know what lies within so that they can share with the world. The business fair that you guys do is one of my very favorite events. I, the first time Lewis uh, uh, participated in the business fair, it was so fun to watch the kids uh, not only see their idea come to fruition and kind of see how it does, but they are, they're set up right next to other young entrepreneurs, you know, their, their classmates and friends and all in one place, they get to see, Oh, you know, her idea is pretty good. Why didn't I think of that boy? And maybe that thing over there didn't, uh, didn't work out so well, 
Look, mm-hmm. look what she did with signage. All this, all this data and comparison. And uh, one of the happy surprises for me at the uh, the kids business fair was many of them shared with me who they're. I'm saving up to go buy that product from that person. You know, they <laughs> they oh, yeah. did commerce with each other. Yes, just like a farmer's market, right? Yes, <laughs> all the time. But the the other thing that's really special about that is that parents are not allowed to participate, right? And so in so many other huge projects that happen in schools all around the country, you know, 50% of that is parent involvement, right? And so the business fair, like one of the rules as they sign up for the business fair and register is like you you can employ your parent and pay them, but they may not help you or sell or market unless you're paying them as an employee. So that's a really unique kind of twist too. Fascinating. I love it. Oh my gosh. Well, um, are, are Lindy, are there signs in a, in a child? Like, what would you say to a parent are maybe some signs that an Acton would be, might be a good choice for their, for their child? So I would say if I can go beyond just Acton, um, the reasons why I particularly started a school, what Two things kind of drove that decision. Three, if we're talking about my individual kids. One was to preserve childhood. And two was to provide psychological safety for children. So I wanted to preserve creativity and curiosity in Emmy and Tenor and Beckham. And this is a way that I do that. So I would say more, more than just bringing you to Acton, some things that you can watch for that your child might be showing you whatever educational environment they're in is not fitting would be fighting with you to go to school in the morning, crying about going to school, having a bad day every day at school, using the word bullying when they respond to how school is going for them, Um, feeling insecure about their uh, their abilities in relation to their peers, comparison to their peers academically, self-hate talk. You hear that come out sometimes. The other is test anxiety, anxiety around testing, uh, physical symptoms like biting fingernails, pulling out hair or eyelashes, not eating, not sleeping. All of these things are, are our body's way of showing that we're not in the right space. And so at Acton, I'm very keen to tune into, and I have so many stories just in four years of starting this school, of children that exhibited these physical symptoms or these emotional symptoms somewhere else. And within a week, a month, or a session, they're gone. Medication's done. Like, so for me, it's more about the bigger picture of your child feeling safe, secure, and excited to go to school because like you know tony like when our school ends at three they they don't get in the cars i'm like it's (laughs) when we have a very true when we have a week off like my own middle child's like ah i can't i don't like weeks off i want to be at school and so i just would say that there are schools out there where children want to be there so bad that they don't want breaks they don't want weekends Right. And sometimes, you know, people get um, they hear the phrase alternative school or alternative education, and they assume that Acton is for bad kids so that they can run around. That is the absolute wrong way to see Acton Academy. Acton Academy is for children who are creative and curious, which aren't they all at one point? Sure. (laughs) And it's for kids who really want to tap into learning and love learning for their whole life. Mm. So all those signs I just talked about, those are signs that your children are starting to hate learning and hate the place or the people that they're learning with, which if they stay in that for 13 years, they're going to go out into the world and still hate learning because they're associating it with all of those things. So. It's amazing. Uh, nearly every, you know, symptom that you mentioned uh, <laughs> checks a box 
for Lewis in our own experience. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I can tell you, and you, you know this because you see Lewis every day, his, his turnaround was basically instant. He, he went from dreading school to breathing a sigh of relief uh, literally by the end of day one. And mm -hmm. <laughs> it's one of those things it would almost be hard to believe had I not witnessed it myself. And of course, I'm, I'm not saying, and I know you're not saying, you know, acting would work for every last child, who knows, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you deserve, uh, thanks and kudos and whatever else, because it, at least with, uh, Lewis Robert Val, it's worked, it's worked wonderfully. And he, if he has too much time off, he, he, he misses it. He misses his friends at school. He wants to go back. I never thought I would see that ever. But I'm so glad. Are. And I will say that I originally started our school for a solution for our children that gave, you know, gave them those things like pride in their work and happiness with their schedule and um, just comfort with learning and being in a school. But like if uh, if if Lewis was the only success story, this whole thing will be worth it. So. I hear you, but I know he's not. He has there's... so many more, but I just want to, I just want the audience to know that um, just changing the world for one person and family is why we started this. And we've gotten to see the ripple effect of that mission over and over and over again. And so now the world gets Lewis, right? A very different version of Lewis than they would have gotten five years ago if he would have stayed on that track. So that's why we do this. Yes, yes, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Lindy, how can someone reach out to you if they wanna learn more about uh, Acton Academy in the Indianapolis area? Yeah, so we have two campuses in, Indy that, in the area. So uh, actonfishers.com and actonfallcreek.com. And then we have a location starting in Muncie in the fall. And we have a couple of other sister schools, I call them, um, in Northwest Indy and Morgantown, and one starting uh, near Turkey Run State Park in the fall. So for me personally, it's info at actonfishers.com is the email address or info at actonfallcreek.com. You can also follow us on social because we post the stories of our school there. So Acton Fall Creek, Acton Fishers are our handles on Facebook and Instagram. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Lindy, it's been great visiting with you. You too. And uh, let's do it again sometime soon. Yeah, sounds great.